Hi, it is Moby from the T-Hud Popcast. If you're looking for some commentary on video games, movies, TV, and streaming, as well as board games with a healthy dose of corny humor, uh, check us out. We are at www.ttpopcast.com, all one word. So www.tt, like Ted, Ted, Popcast, like popcorn.com, and we hope to see you there. Hello and welcome to the Rating Room Podcast. It's Jay and Andy again. Uh, we've got another special episode for you today. From the T-Hood Popcast, we have Moby. Uh, Moby, thanks for being on the show. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, hi guys. I, again, thanks so much for uh, having me on here. Um, really excited to do the, the podcast with you today. Uh, yeah, I'm based uh, just outside of Vancouver, Canada. So you've got uh, you know someone here on the other side of the pond from you guys. Uh, I have been a podcaster with my partner Leland, uh, who actually found you and found uh, the opportunity for me to potentially be on the show. Uh, we've been doing that podcast for about five years now, a little bit over, and it's been an amazing experience. Leland actually uh, just a couple weeks ago quit his day job to do podcasting uh, full time, make a career of it, or at least try. So. Very exciting. He has a, a much, <laughs> a much more popular podcast uh, than the T Hud podcast, but that one's still special uh, with his heart. So he does do both. Um, but uh, yeah, I plan on doing it as as long as Leland's willing to continue doing it with me. That's great. So thanks, maybe, for agreeing to come onto the rating room. So continue with the theme of James Bond. Let's get into it. So Moby, what is the earliest Bond memory that you have? Yeah, it, it's interesting. It, um, I, I know for sure it was when my family rented GoldenEye and VHS, which must have been late 1995 or early 1996. Um, what was unique about that is I was raised in a somewhat conservative home. Really, my mother was conservative when it came to um, violence and sexuality in movies. And I was 11 years old at the time, and a lot of what I was able to watch at the time was uh, perhaps not what a preteen would consider cool. Um, so not not a lot of action movies or anything like that. Um, but my mom had been a huge James Bond fan growing up and she kind of had this quirk where uh, if she liked something and she thought it was quote unquote good, good media like the James Bond series was, Oh, then that's okay. You know, you might have another action movie that came out the summer of 1996 with even less violence or sexuality than James Bond. But I don't know what that is, but I do know what James Bond is. And and so we were almost given a free pass as kids. I have a brother and sister as well. And my brother, who's a year and a half younger, watched a lot of Bond with me. And so that really led into... I would want to call it the summer of Bond, but it really was the year of Bond because I loved GoldenEye. Um, it remains my favorite James Bond movie. And we would just rent James Bond, the whole series, two, three VHSs at a time every week. And we probably went through the, the entire series up to that point uh, for over a year. I, I think it got to the point that we may have perhaps rented one or two new releases at that time, but we would always get a bond uh, alongside for maybe the next 12 to 18 months after GoldenEye. That's great. So GoldenEye is still to this day your favorite, even you know, 27, 28 years later. It, it is. It is. And as a real fan of the series, I've had to consider, um, is it my rose-colored glasses in the fact that this was the first James Bond that I saw. It blew me away is nostalgia is the fact that it came first, the reason why it's my favorite. And I really don't think so. I really don't think so. 
as I've watched the film several times, even in the last few years, I just think it has, for me, the best mix of bad guy, um, of villains. And honestly, this is very divisive when it comes to GoldenEye, but I really like the music. I really like Eric Serra's score, and I know that's quite controversial, but like they say with wine, drink what you like. And I like the the soundtrack of GoldenEye. So is there any other bits that you like from GoldenEye that really stand out? Because obviously you mentioned about the villain, the the mix of action. What what makes it your, your favorite Bond film? Uh, well, other than a slightly innuendo joke in saying that Xenia on a top probably kicked off my puberty, uh, I just thought that, you know, she was a fantastic henchwoman very well acted by Famke Jansen. I was always a fan, even as a much younger kid of history, military history, and even the Cold War history at the point. Of course, the Cold War had only been over for about five years, but seeing Statue Park and having it, the film at least partially uh, to do with the legacy of the Soviet Union in Russia, just a little bit with hints there, uh, especially in the opening scene, I was really interested in that. I really like Gottfried John's performance. Uh, I'm, I'm just kind of skirting around Sean Bean because I thought Sean Bean was fantastic. I'm trying to discuss the little nuggets of the film that I like in addition to the Sean Bean and, and Pierce Brosnan dynamic. Uh, I thought, yeah, so I thought Gottfried John was great. Also, oddly, it's one of the only James Bonds that gives a shout out to a Canadian of any sort. Now, unfortunately, it's the Canadian Admiral who is killed by Xenia in that early scene. However, they do show his ID card and that it says he's this Canadian ad Admiral. His name was Chuck Farrell. And at the time, I thought that was really cool. I thought, hey, there's the spy movie and... Okay, he didn't do anything heroic, but at least a Canadian was in it for a portion. Uh, so music. Oh, I and I got to give uh, props to both M and Q. In my opinion, both scenes, the scenes where Bond first meets M, she calls him a sexist, misogynist dinosaur, a relic of the Cold War. Bond tries to have a drink. He says, you know, your predecessor kept such and such in the shelf. She goes, I prefer bourbon. I loved that very snappy power interplay. As well as Q. Q just had a very fantastic scene with Bond. A classic. Uh, at the end of that scene with Q where he's got his sandwich and Bond touches it. And Q goes, don't touch that. It's my lunch. And grabs it back. My friends and I at school, we would joke for probably four years because, of course, the video game came out two years later, very popular with my friends, the GoldenEye video game. So when it was lunchtime at school, if we were to accidentally brush our friend's lunch, they would act like they were Q and go, don't touch that. That's my lunch. So we had a running gag going. Oh, that's fantastic. I mean, we could talk GoldenEye all day, but I do need to give props to the game. Yes. Still to this day, maybe one of the best games ever. It's just just oh, perfect. Oh, yeah. Like the, the, not only the, the one-player mode, but the multiplayer as well. Just hours and hours of fun. Yeah, I remember I was at a birthday party for one of my best friends when it first came out, and he had just got it. And to, when I think I was 14 years old at the time, and to be able to play four-player multiplayer with a flat of cola. It was like life could not get any better at that point. But of course I mentioned I had a conservative mother. She didn't like humans being shot, but there was paintball mode in GoldenEye. So I remember being on the phone, begging her that it's just paintballs and I promise we'll have paintball mode on the whole time and not real bullets. And when I convinced her to to allow me to play it at that birthday party because my friend's mom knew my mom very well and was like, well, is Moby allowed to play this? He should give his mom a call. And I went, oh no, rolling my eyes. So I convinced her and I was allowed to play the game and it was, it was fantastic. I could go more on the game, but I know 
I know we've got a lot to cover. So Moby, you, you've just talked about what your favorite Bond film is. So what about looking at it from the other end? What is the worst Bond film in your opinion? Well, in this one is not really a hot take, as they say. I think this is fairly commonly considered one of the worst Bonds, which is Quantum of Solace. Uh, for the reasons for that, I blame a couple things. First of all, the Craig era just isn't my favorite era. I do hold Skyfall in very high regard. However, that's the only Craig film I hold in a very high regard. Uh, however, if you know the backstory of Quantum of Solace, uh, which I understand um, you, know, you two are still getting your feet uh, really wet when it comes to Bond, there was a Hollywood writer strike on at that time. So the ability to write and revise the script for Quantum of Solace was uh, very difficult. And I think that's reflected in the film. It's just, it's not terrible, but it is just forgettable in every possible way. I felt the villain was forgettable. The Bond girls were forgettable. What happens in the film were for, was forgettable. Just very forgettable. And, you know, so, someone once told me, hate is closer to love than is apathy. And for Quantum of Solace, I just feel apathy. That's, uh, that's an interesting take, and um, I, I've got a feeling that some of your opinions there may be, may be shared. We shall see. Uh, but let's let's switch gears slightly, and let's talk about Bond himself, as in the actors who played Bond. Do you have a particular favourite that played the role? I do, and again, this may be my rose-coloured glasses, as I called it before, with uh, how I was introduced to the series. My favourite is Pierce Brosnan. If you were to ask me to try to nail down why... I think he had the best balance of class, humor, yet he was still dangerous, yet he still looked that traditional Bond, tall, dark, handsome. I just think he was almost a man after my own heart. And before anybody laughs and goes, well, you're a podcaster, you're nothing like James Bond. What I try to be in my life is well balanced. I don't actually try to be excellent in any certain area. I always try to spend time to be well-rounded, and I felt Pierce Brosnan was that. Now, if you were to ask me who do I think is the best James Bond, that's a different question. I think even though he only did two films, Timothy Delton was the best James Bond. Full disclosure, I have not read the Fleming novels. However, I have looked into them. I've read excerpts. I've watched a lot of, for example, YouTube documentaries on what they were. Uh, there is an original illustration of what James Bond is supposed to look like from the 1960s. And Tim Delton just nails that. And I know he doesn't come off as the most charismatic Bond at all. In fact, he's quite crass and intense. But I, I think he's the closest to the Fleming Bond that has ever been filmed. Even more so than Craig. So, moving on. Maybe we, we've talked about favorite Bond films, favorite Bond actors. Another thing that's really synonymous with the, the Bond franchise is the theme song. So do you have a favorite theme song? I do. I do. And this one is really off the board. I know I informed you two of it in advance, but it's actually the B-side theme from Living Daylights. It's called Where Is Everybody Gone by a band called The Pretenders. Now, with lyrics, I do not believe that song appeared with lyrics in the film. However, Necros, one of the main henchmen, he, whenever he does Necro stuff, he attacks in certain scenes Bond or, or certain agents. That song plays without lyrics. And even then, it just has a killer bass line. I'm not going to try to... Uh, mimic it but I would say look it up it's all over YouTube where has everybody gone by the pretenders look it up that's that's my favorite and if you were to uh, force me to pick an actual theme for James Bond an a side theme for the lack of a better term it would be a view to to the kill a view to a kill um, I just love Duran Duran and I love that opening uh, title sequence with their music and I love the backstory with Duran Duran doing uh, that theme song. 
Um, I'm going to get the name wrong, the first name wrong. It, I believe it was the bassist for Duran Duran. His last name was Taylor. It might have been John Taylor or something like that. Um, I might have got that wrong. But the true story is, and this is actually in a documentary I saw that was on my A View to a Kill DVD, is he was drunk one night and Cubby Broccoli was at the same bar and he came up and he used some more colorful language I won't use here, but he basically said, why don't you have a real band do a song for Bond? Because this Taylor guy was a huge James Bond fan. Like, again, he was inebriated, but he basically came in and said, hey, Cubby, you know, let us do a song for you. And and they did. And I thought it was the best song of the... Uh, the series yeah you're correct john taylor and um a fantastic choice of song that was one it's just a great song not never mind a bond song it's just a great song i think it, it really really kick-started bond in the 80s for me a- absolutely there's a there's a 12 minute extended cut of that song i don't know if it's official or not but it's also on youtube and i listen to that often as i work it's just the right balance of go get it energy but it's not overwhelming and that is prime on my playlist excellent so music is a big staple of the bond franchise but so are the bond girls do you have any bond girls that stand out as your favorite yeah and it's uh it's interesting the language you use there which is the language that you should use stand out i like bond girls that stand out i also have a weird quirk where obviously i as a heterosexual man myself, I, I can realize when a woman is beautiful, but for me to actually really have her imprint in my mind, I have to convince myself, even if even if it's a celebrity that I've never met, I have to convince myself that I would have a personality connection with that character if that character was real. And th- the character of Vesper Lind, that's my favorite Bond girl, uh, she is very much the kind of woman that I tend to date in real life. I'm more bubbly. I'm a little bit more scatterbrained, right-brained, feeling-based, intuitive. And I'm attracted, obviously, opposites attract. I like personalities that are a little bit more intense, straightforward. And Vesper Lind is is like that. I mean... And she's introduced perfectly for someone like me to just fall for her as a celebrity crush or whatever you want to call it on that train in Montenegro when she first meets Bond. Uh, They just have an amazing conversation where he's trying to charm her and she's basically like, I'm just an accountant to cross the T's and dot the I's. Of course, she becomes more later, but uh, I... I just thought that was a fantastic introduction and and she's Eva Green, the actress, she's very beautiful as well. So, you know, you, you just mentioned Eva Green and, you know, your, your favourite Bond girl and we, we've talked about your favourite theme songs, favourite Bond actors. So looking at it from kind of a, a main henchman, main villain, what is the, the standout villain for you in the franchise? And this is where, <laughs> this is where I, I again, I keep, going golden eye golden eye golden eye and how am i going to sound when your listeners hear me talk about this but my favorite villain i have to be honest is alec trevelyan and i love sean bean i love sean bean in a host of other work he's done outside of golden eye however i do feel he really came off as james bond's equal now certain villain certain actors i should say of other bond villains in the past have said uh well i think you know i love being this villain because it was bond's equal and it's just my opinion but in those films i would disagree i'm trying to remember the name of the actor because he's not super famous but um i believe the character's name was sanchez the main bad guy from license to kill i saw in an interview that actor said Oh, I was as suave as Bond. I was Bond's equal. No, Bond's equal is another double O agent who also happens to be as suave, just with similar skills. You really buy in that Sean Bean's character, that Alec Trevelyan is is just as dangerous as Bond. Like he could be Bond if Bond 
went off the deep end mentally and opened his own crime syndicate. And I felt their fighting was very well choreographed in the film as well. And I, I mean, I could go on probably too long about all the nuances of why I like Alec Trevelyan so much. Uh, there's a little tinge of tragedy to his tale because I'm sure... I'm sure he never would have wanted to clash with James Bond in the film. Bond really has to seek him out. Now, of course he's seeking out this mysterious crime boss, Janice. He doesn't know it's Alec Trevelyan yet, but Bond really, really has to put some effort to get to him. And I think that part of the tragedy of that tale is that they probably both wish they never met up. That this didn't have to happen because you do buy that they were good friends in that opening scene. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the opening scene really sets sets the stage for what they're all about, and the fact that he is a double O agent himself completely agree. And I, I believe Sean Bean actually got the part by auditioning for for the role of Bond, and he was rejected for Bond, but they liked him enough to say, "Well, actually, instead of Bond, why not be Trevelyan?" That is correct. I I heard that myself recently. There's um <clears throat> there's an excellent YouTuber named Calvin Dyson who's also from the UK. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of him, but he does uh, YouTube reviews on James Bond, and he was the one who actually informed me uh, when I watched his Goldeneye uh, deep dive documentary that uh alec or sorry that sean bean had tried out for bond didn't make it but was given this other part and there's little nuances that make you buy how dangerous 006 is in one of the very first shots of goldeneye when they're in the labs at the dam at the facility uh alec trevelyan just shoots a scientist in the back and there's really no reason for it. The scientist has his back turned and Alec just opens a door and shoots him in the back and in cold blood. And it really had an impact on me. I remember that first time watching that VHS going, wow, like, okay, I don't know where this character is going or who he is yet, but he just shot a scientist in the back. Like that's mean. So a great, Great mem- uh, opening scene for for Bond. One one of the the better debuts. Where I think Jay and I talked about this on the the main pod. One of the the better debuts for a new Bond actor. Uh, but I want to cast the net a little bit wider, if I may, and talk about other memorable scenes from the Bond franchise. So, over the past sixty odd years, there's been countless, I'm sure. But which which are the ones that come to mind when we think memorable scenes? Well, I have a few, and in the interest of time, I won't give as much detail as I have to the other questions, um, because we still have a fair bit to get through. Uh, Number one, I would say, was the death of Tracy Bond, uh, James Bond's wife in Honor Majesty's Secret Service. I'm sorry, spoilers alert for yourself or any of your listeners that haven't watched the films yet, but I have to answer the question honestly, so... She dies at the end. That's probably the best acting that George Lazenby has in the entire film is that final shot. So that's number one. Number two was when Jaws turned good. So when I was first watching the VHS going through the series, and I did go chronologically that first year after uh, uh, I saw Goldeneye at first. When I saw Moonraker, one of my favorite Bonds, top ten, And I saw that Jaws became good at the end. I was so happy as a kid because I always wonder, why did he have to be so bad? Why couldn't he be a gentle giant? I know he's ugly and he's got these huge teeth. And However, apparently I wasn't alone with that because a documentary I saw on Moonraker said that many kids wrote in to Louis Gilbert, the director at the time, and said, why does Jaws have to be bad? He feels like he should be good. And so they did that. Uh, And finally, for Craig, uh, I've said before that the Craig uh, part of the franchise is not my favorite. However, there are many good moments. Judy Dench's death, M's death, in Skyfall uh, was just amazing. It was very emotional. I cried myself the first time I saw it. I just felt that it was well acted by everybody. So, yeah, that was memorable moment number three so 
you you prefer Jaws as a as a goodie compared to a villain. I do, and if I were to say what I really like is how he has that two film arc, where in the Spy Who Loved Me, he is just completely bad the whole film when he pops up, and and that's fine. But in Moonraker, all early on, you start to see cracks that he might not be so bad deep down inside because at least he has a sense of humor there's that scene in brazil at the carnival where he's about to to kill one of the bond girls and people start to come around and so he kind of dances with her and flings her around with a big smile and even though that's an intense scene he's about to assassinate someone you're like he has a sense of humor he's not just this giant seven foot tall robot so i like his arc so next question, Moby. So in the franchise, James Bond has access to lots of different gadgets. And we, we talk about the gadgets for each of the films in, in our main season. So do you have any particular favorite gadgets that Bond utilizes in, in a film? Yeah, I do. Uh, there's several I like, actually, but I did just want to pick one, which is actually one of his cars, which is the uh, V8 Volante. I think it's Aston Martin. It's in two films, actually. Uh, the exact car is in The Living Daylights as well as No Time to Die, the most recent Bond film. It's actually in the most recent Bond film. It's it's Bond's wife's uh, car, so which I thought was fantastic. I just thought the car looked really cool. I'm a big fan of 1980s everything, movies, film, aesthetics. So I, I thought the car looked really cool. I thought it was well used in Living Daylights in particular. Uh, there's that one, that one thing, I think it's, I can't remember if Timothy Delton uses a device in the car or it's just during a scene right before the car. So forgive me if a listener knows the scene better than I do, but I believe he uses the car to cut an opponent's, a henchman's car in half. And Timothy Delton makes this quip or sorry, for the Bond girl with him, uh, I forget her name in the sh- in the movie, but the actress is Miriam Debo. She goes, what happened to that car? And Bond just goes, salt corrosion. It's, it's so over the top because he just cut this car in half that it's one of my two favorite jokes in the entire series of James Bond. Um, I won't spoil No Time to Die because that's so new of a movie. And I know many of your listeners, even by the time this airs, may not have seen it yet. But... Uh, it's used in a very emotional, impactful scene in that film. Indeed, it is. We shall uh, say no more at this point. Um, but obviously, we're we're all on this pod because we're huge fans, super fans even, um, in some cases, of the Bond franchise. But it's not been all sweetness and light. There has been some low points throughout. What would you say, in your opinion, is is the lowest point of the franchise? The low point for me is definitely the movie A View to a Kill. I remember at that time, again, that first year, renting all of them on VHS. My family didn't own any. We just rented them all. And by the time I got to View to a Kill, it felt wrong. It felt off in a way that no other Bond did to me until actually Casino Royale, where Roger Moore just seemed too old. He looked like he had a lot of makeup on in many scenes. I could tell that a stunt double was used for him a lot. I thought that Stacey Sutton just was almost a cartoony Bond girl, just over the top and no real chemistry with Roger Moore, in my opinion. Now, Christopher Walken as well. I love Christopher Walken as an actor, and I love the fact that he was going to be a Bond villain. So maybe I had too high of expectations, but I felt like his performance was subdued in not a traditional Christopher Walken way, almost as if he didn't get a lot of direction. This is, again, just my opinion, but it felt like the director basically was like, whoa, Christopher Walken, big Oscar-winning actor, even at that time, just let him do his thing. And unfortunately, I don't think that worked very well. But then that muted performance is juxtaposed to the scene near the end where 
he has to gun down his own men and he's taking pleasure in it with a machine gun. And that's just not, that's just not what a Bond henchman is to me. I mean, of course they're evil and they're megalomaniacs and they Spectre and all these different baddies that Bond's ran into through the years, but none of them are just so outright murderous and brutal as that. And Again, this is all my opinion, but it just didn't stick well with me in that whole film. Just doesn't, doesn't, to this day, doesn't stick well with me, with the exception of that theme song, which I love. So what did you think of Mayday? I, I liked Mayday as a character. I thought she had, of course, she's a very striking person with her features. She was a model. She's very brutal, very androgynous. We mentioned earlier bond women that stick out now i wouldn't call her a bond she's not a bond girl even though james bond does does get his jollies in with her at one point uh but she's a a henchwoman and i do like her intensity i do like how brutal she is i like how athletic she is uh her and roger moore i know had no chemistry i've looked into this behind the scenes uh, so I think that dynamic taints her as a character, but uh, otherwise, I just think she was a misused character. That's how I'll put it. We we talked about a few of those things, didn't we, Andy? In our main pod when we we watched A View to a Kill. Yeah, you you, you mentioned the word standout, and for me, Mayday is a standout Bond girl, as it were. Um, but but you're right in in terms of how how she i mean i was a big fan of her but i think it's because of the differences not in spite of i think i think it was that yeah that kind of juxtaposition against the traditional bond girl that for me stood out in potentially a good way but going back to your earlier point on christopher walker i've not really thought of it like the the cruelty aspect of it but yeah there's there's a difference between being selfish and leaving men behind or betraying people to just being outright murderous like you said so it's a a good good analogy there thank you i appreciate that and you know i would just add that most most bond villains had a sort of charm to them i really didn't find christopher walken's character to have really any sort of charm superficial or with his sense of humor in the film or anything like that he he's just kind of there doing evil things until bond puts a stop to it so Moby, you mentioned earlier a, a a line that you you liked from the Living Daylights. So is that your favorite one-liner quote from the franchise, or do you have another one? I I do have a number one. Uh, Salt corrosion was number two. Um, number one is Drax and Moonraker when he asked Bond, "May I press you for a cucumber sandwich?" Because oh, I mean, so many things I could say to that. Obviously, it's an innuendo. Uh, however, just how Michael Lonsdale played that character was so good because he just keeps this very suave, straight face, no matter what he's saying in that entire film. And this is the James Bond that goes to space. Like there's a lot of megalomaniac in his character to, for this film, but you know bond may i press you for a cucumber sandwich it's an over-the-top line it's a line that immediately as a kid made me think because i didn't go to the innuendo at first i was 11 years old and i went who the heck eats cucumber sandwiches and why is this rich man offering a sandwich with cucumbers and then as i got older and rewatched the film and became more aware of the nuances of innuendo as I became a teenager and a young adult. Then it was like, oh, press for a cucumber sandwich. Okay. That's weird. That's out there, but it's a hilarious line. So do you think there's a a particular Bond actor that delivers better than the other Bond actors? Or do you think all the Bond actors deliver the one-liner, you know, really well? Or is there a particular one that you think, oh, he he just stands out? compared to the other Bond actors? I, I think there's two. Now, I I don't think I could rate them on the spot, but I think 
I'll still try. I do think Sean Connery was the best for the one-liners. I would put Pierce Brosnan as a second and Timothy Dalton as a third. Again, I don't think Timothy Dalton in his two films is much known for his one-liners, but he's such an intense Bond actor that when he does give his one-liners, they really stick out, whether they're kind of a real stab to the villain's proverbial throat or whether they're a big tease to uh his uh his the bond woman that he's with at the time or whatever the situation i love how tim dalton always poked fun at uh miriam dabo's uh, bond girl for the cello that she insists on bringing everywhere they're on this life and death escape and she insists this little blonde woman insists on bringing her giant cello everywhere and bond just wants none of that uh, but yeah, I, I would put Roger Moore actually was quite good with those two. I would, I would put actually, you know, Roger Moore even above. Yeah. He'd have to go above Dalton. I might even put Roger Moore thinking about it, uh, above Pierce Brosnan. So I would probably still go Connery Moore Brosnan for the one liners. And then I, I just, if Daniel Craig or, or, uh, Oh, why am I drawing a blank? Um, Lazenby. only in one. Lazenby, that's it. If Daniel Craig or Lazenby delivered good one-liners, I just don't remember them, to be honest. Yeah, I think I tend to agree with you about Connery. Connery had a, a sophistication about him. I think uh, for more, and this is something Jay and I touched on in a previous episode, it felt like there was quantity, not always quality, with more. And I think Moore had a bit of a, um, more of an association, not not a smoothness as such, but it was it was always a little bit tongue in cheek. Whereas Connery just had that right balance for me in terms of it was funny, but he was still cool with it. Whereas Moore was a little bit silly at times with some of the one liners. Maybe that's just a maybe that's a script writing thing rather than a delivery thing. But I, I don't know. I think uh, Moore probably had more, but Connery had the the quality ones in my opinion. Yeah, I, I, I would say that's smart, and I would agree with that. I think that Moore was the most laid-back, fun, even comical Bond of all of them. But when you said quantity over quality, I would agree with that. Because the moment you said that, it I did go, oh, yes. Actually, Moore was cracking one-liners all the time, almost to the detriment of his character. And I think that's why, particularly in the film... Uh, uh, not not Spy Who Loved Me for your eyes only for your eyes only they took a little bit of a U-turn with Moore's character and they made him crack a few less one-liners and do a few more cold-hearted things such as kicking a car with a henchman off a cliff and I think that was a reaction a deliberate reaction by the writers and producers to Moore be, having become too comical so that's a long-winded way of saying, yeah, I agree with you. That stuff. Now, my next question was going to be about the Bond books, but you mentioned earlier you've, you've not read any of the, the books. Would that be correct? Do you, do you plan to read any of the books or short stories, or is it just not something that you're interested in? To, to answer truthfully, I would say I'm not planning on it, meaning I ha don't have it in the back of my mind that I have to go to a bookstore, an online website, and buy one of the books sooner or later the closest i've come is that i do want to read what has not yet been adapted and i realize that it's only a few short stories and i believe one book uh some something you know something from a lady it's called or, there may be a second book too that hasn't been adapted but it's only one or two and uh i think there's actually one called james bond in new york very, very interesting name. Um, but whatever of the back catalog has not been adapted would be the first books or short stories that I would read. But no, I'm not. I, I can't say I have firm plans on it. Yeah, I mean, I've not read the novels either myself. I did read a book of James Bond short stories quite a long time ago. And hit and miss, I would say. One of them that fascinated me, and I'm not sure if it was the Quantum of Solace short story, 
Uh, I may be wrong on that, but the story wasn't about James Bond. It was James Bond at a bar telling a story. And then he tells the story, but it's not about James Bond. And then it ends with him at the bar finishing his story and that's it. So it's a Bond story without Bond in it, pretty much, which was very strange. It just seemed really out of place. That is strange. That does seem out of place. That seems like surprisingly creative narrative for what I guess Fleming would have been writing in the 1950s, 1960s. Uh, I'm surprised to hear that. I had not heard of that. Uh, but yeah, that's very creative. Yeah, certainly a long, long, long time ago. I, I, I might revisit that because I probably got it on my bookshelf somewhere. Um, but yeah, um, for me, Bond is a is a film, a film creation rather than a book creation in my head, at least. Right. Yeah, and I would agree with that. I mean, obviously, having not read any of the books or the short stories, Bond is. Bond is 90% film for me and 10% documentaries and uh, deep dive, say, essays that I've read or discussions on YouTube that I've watched um, because I do do a lot of looking into James Bond outside of simply watching the films. And I would say that that has tainted, for better or worse, many of the... Uh, films, the actors, the Bond girls, etc. as new information has been brought to me that I didn't know, sometimes behind the scenes. So as part of our main season of The Rating Room, we, we did a special episode where we, myself and Andy, talked about who we thought could play the next James Bond. So do you have any thoughts on that? Who, who would be your favourite for the next Bond? Yeah, now I have a current favourite... Um, but I will also give you a second name that I wish could have been James Bond, but unfortunately I just think he's far too old now. He's missed his time. So the, out of the current actors that I think could step into the role right now that I would like to see is, is Henry Cavill. I quite like Henry Cavill. I believe that's probably going to be a hot take and I could just hear in my mind, as I said, that booze from half of your audience saying, Henry Cavill, Superman, he's he's too quiet. He doesn't have enough charisma. But I think that quiet nature, uh, they said they want to make Bond a little bit more sensitive. I think Cavill can pull that off. But I also think he can pull off action. I think he can be brutal at times. I just think he needs good direction. But I think he's a good actor and I think he looks the part. Now, the actor I wish could have been James Bond was Clive Owen. I was really pulling for Clive Owen at the time Daniel Craig was being considered. Uh, that was right after, I believe, I'd seen Children of Men, which starred Clive Owen. Uh, he, he, to me, should have been the Bond of the mid-2000s, and I, I will take that to my grave, proverbial or literal, that of that generation, it should have been Clive Owen. I remember, vaguely remember the time that Clive Owen was basically the favourite and everyone was surprised. Like, Daniel Craig, really? This guy? Um, but yeah, that's that's a good shout. And with Henry Cavill, of course, he was apparently second choice behind Daniel Craig, although he missed out because he was too young at the time. Do you think, was he was it 22, 23? Do you think that would have been too soon for him? Considering that Casino Royale and the Craig era was effectively a reboot, I think it maybe could have worked, but is, is early to mid-20s too young for a new Bond? You know, that's that's a very good question, and that's a very interesting question, even just considering Cavill himself. I do believe that he's improved a lot as an actor and that his personal confidence as a man, as much as I can see in interviews and in his acting, has improved since he first came into Hollywood. So I tend to wonder if he would even be able to bring the same skill and persona that I believe he would bring now that long ago. But as you said, very correctly, it was a soft reboot from Baby Bond, for the lack of a better term, where he just gets his double O status in the beginning of Casino Royale. And yeah, I think age-wise, taken alone, I think early, mid-20s Bond could have worked as far as age goes no problem 
good stuff. So one more from me before we get into some some ratings. So was there any particular film that you were looking forward to more than the others? And did that film meet your expectations? Yeah, so this is going to be a, an answer, unfortunately, with a negative opinion. Uh, Casino Royale. So given the fact that I jumped on to Bond right as Goldeneye was released, essentially, Pierce Brosnan was all that I had seen as a current Bond. So Daniel Craig, for me, was the first Bond that was going to be new. He was the first Bond where I tried to read everything I could find on the internet about the casting process and who was being considered. So Daniel Craig, I, I didn't know him well. I hadn't seen, I believe, his only big film at the time was Layer Cake. I hadn't seen that. And when I saw him, pictures of him when he was hired as Bond, I went, what? Like this guy? I mean, no, no offense at all the people that are below average in height, but Bond is traditionally quite tall over six feet i think daniel craig's 510 something like that uh there was that saying blonde not bond because he was blonde and that that didn't work well craig to this day is still not one of my favorite bonds he's he's pretty low on the list it's tough because all the other james bond actors came out before unfortunately they started to pass away but I did read an article at one point where they all said unanimously that Daniel Craig was was the best James Bond. Now, when all the other actors are saying that, you kind of go, well, I mean, they would know best, I think. But for me, I just, I, I don't think so. And I thought Casino Royale was, as far as a film itself, was really messy until you see that shot of the train going to Montenegro where Bond meets Vesper Lind. I do think the film improved a lot there. I felt the casino segments with the poker game was good. I thought it was well acted. I just thought really that beginning was was quite messy. And I didn't like that there was no Q. I've always loved Q. I know they brought him in later. And I really liked Ben Wishaw when they did bring him in later in, in other films. But to me it didn't... It just didn't really seem James Bondy, And I did not actually know that it was a soft reboot at the time. I only learned that immediately while well, watching the film and immediately after. Because I watched that opening sequence. I'm like, wait, sorry. He just got his double O uh, registration now? I don't get it. He's This is a character that's been around for 40 years. He's He's been a double O all this time. And so that was very confusing to me from the opening scene, simply because I didn't do my homework enough, I guess, or I was living under a rock. But yeah, it was disappointing. Disappointing is how I would say. Moving on. So in, in the Rating Room podcast, we, myself and Andy, we rank each of the films that we watch them each week, maybe. And we, we also rank various elements like Bond Girls theme songs, etc. So continuing with that theme, can you just tell us what are your top five Bond films? Uh, number one is Goldeneye, the kind of theme of this podcast episode. I don't know if Goldeneye will ever get dethroned. Living Daylights, I love the car. I love Tim Dalton. I love the opening scene at uh, Gibraltar. I thought that was one of the best opening scenes for James Bond. Love the music. Love the enemies, uh, like Necros. Uh... Love the actors in it, Joe Don Baker, John Reese davies uh, The only thing I really didn't like about The Living Daylights was I did not like Miriam Dabo as a, a Bond girl. I just thought she was forgettable and, and very passive. Uh, Skyfall is my number three. Skyfall was actually my pleasant surprise, very much so of the Craig era. By far, it is my favorite of Craig's films. I thought Sam Mendes did an excellent job uh, directing. There's that scene where Bond is fighting at night on the skyscraper and there's all neon lighting everywhere. Just absolutely beautiful. Very emotionally touching. Uh, I really like S Severine, I think her name is, as a Bond girl. Just uh, I just find the actress who plays her very attractive. My, my first girlfriend actually looked exactly like her and I was... A lucky man, and I should have held on to her, I guess. But, uh, 
she she kind of brought back good memories in a way i was like trying to see well what if what if she was that in the james bond universe that would have been cool um spy who loved me now spy who loved me is my mom's second favorite bond and i just i really like the bond itself i like the film but i do have good memories of watching that one with her a lot as well as for your eyes only which was her favorite so that's a little bit of good memories good family memories combined with just what i thought was a really solid james bond uh and then my hot take my what pick i think is my number five is the world is not uh the world is not enough now i know christmas jones played by denise richards gets a lot of flack for being not a believable bond girl and that's that's totally fine in my mind she's balanced out by electric king who i think is one of the best bond girls or sexiest combination of bond girl villain and uh i just I, i like the action sequences i i've gone back to that movie basically every few years if i come across a new uh documentary or video on youtube or podcast i listen to that goes the world is not enough the world is not enough is bad for this 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 and this reason i go okay i want to keep an open mind so i put in my dvd and i watch it again and every time i watch it i go no this is incredibly entertaining so it's my solid number five some good picks there and i i agree with you about the world is not enough i surprisingly good that was actually the first bond film i saw at the cinema at uh, i think i was 15 years old at the time and I've watched every Bond film at the cinema since. That kind of started my tradition. Um, but yeah, action-packed, fantastic, fantastic film. So uh, you're going to get no arguments from me in that regard. I love that. Uh, but let's let's talk another top five. Let's talk Bond girls. So you mentioned earlier Vespa Lind. I'm going to assume she's number one. But how, how would uh, two to five look? Okay, so two is an interesting take. Uh, two is Paloma played by Anna de Armas uh, in the most recent Bond film, uh, No Time to Die. Now, she only has a small role, but I, I personally felt she stole that movie because Paloma is, she's so cute, she's bubbly, she's competent, but she she's like, just, it's not that she doesn't see through James Bond and be like, you know, he's this dinosaur man that I find is gross. She just doesn't care. She's on a mission. She's like, you know, change into this. Get your gun. Let's go. Let's. And Bond is trying to almost do his traditional thing. Like, oh, there's a beautiful agent I'm paired with. Do I have to make the moves on her? And he kind of starts to do that a little bit. And she's just like, what are you doing? We have a job to do. And then she kicks absolute butt in her one action scene. Now, I'm a huge Anna de Armas fan outside of bond she and so i'm i'm admittedly tainted by this i absolutely loved her as joy in blade runner 2049 which is my second favorite movie of all time um she (laughs) she's the the desktop background of the computer that i'm talking to you guys on so that's how much i like uh, anna moby sorry just Um, to interrupt you there have you seen knives out i have not but i i'm going to watch it specifically because she's in it She's very good in it, yeah. Yeah. I've got it. Uh, I've actually got it bookmarked specifically because she's in it. And I don't want to go on too much of a tangent, but uh, just last week, actually, in America, a judge allowed a lawsuit to move forward with a couple Anna Durham Mass fans where she was shown in a trailer for a film, but she was completely cut out of the movie. And they're suing for wrongful marketing. And <laughs> I thought to myself... I thought to myself, if I knew those guys and I was interested in that film, I would be signed up to that class action lawsuit. That's the kind of fan I am of Van Darmas. But um, moving along, Xenia on a top is my number three. I I put in brackets when I sent you guys uh, my thoughts in advance, if she can count, because she's not a Bond girl. She's not someone that Bond ever connects with physically outside of a fight, but uh i just thought she was just fantastic over the top she was she was gorgeous she was evil she was suave she's a fighter pilot she can kick butt i just thought she was she was great 
Um, my number four is Paris Carver. And Paris Carver, I thought, Tomorrow Never Dies, uh, I like the film a lot. But I felt it was one of the films that had almost no emotional gravitas to it at all. But Paris Carver does give that. She's a very tragic ex-girlfriend of Bond. It, it seems like she always loved him. She wanted to be with him. I mean, so many, I guess, Bond girls did. But it comes up in their dialogue. And, she, you know, she says that line, was it because I got too close? And Bond just goes, yes. And I love that. Um, unfortunately, she doesn't have a lot of time in the film. But I thought she was... Again, that right balance of gorgeous, she made sense in the story, and she gave just a little bit of emotional gravitas to this uh, Bond film that had very little. Uh, and the last would be Jinx from Die Another Day, played by Halle Berry. Jinx was just very competent. I thought she was a really cool agent. She kind of filled the Felix Leiter uh, position in that film except more deadly and more beautiful than any of the Felix lighters we've obviously ever seen and she was kind of you know Bond's American agent partner for that film and she almost got a spin-off I'm not sure if you knew of that they were very close to doing a, a spin-off movie with her uh, so yeah she's my number five that's brilliant and just um, for um, clarity we have included on a top in our bond girls and bond villains in our main podcast so moving on you've obviously mentioned 006 is your favorite bond villain what are your other favorite bond villains and this can obviously be the, the main villain or one of the henchmen yeah uh electric king is number two from the world is not enough i just thought sophie marceau killed it she comes off at the start as this this, you know, sheltered rich girl daughter of this uh, assassinated oil baron, I think he was. And then slowly it gets revealed that no, like she is, she is this kind of vampire's kiss of death, uh, sultress, whatever you want to call it, a uh, person who's very uh, devoted to the main villain and... Uh, I guess she has Stockholm Syndrome or something. I think they may have even mentioned that. Just a, a complex villain that I think was really well done. Uh, number three, I would say, was Francisco Scaramanga, the man with the golden gun. He, I, yeah, I, I think next to 006, I think he's the closest... Uh, Bond villain that has any right of saying I was close to an equal with Bond. I mean, he's this assassin with a cool gun. He kills with one shot. He's played by Christopher Lee, so he's obviously he's a tall, imposing, deep-voiced man. Um, I just thought he was he was just a fantastic all-around bad guy, mean villain. Uh, next, you did mention henchmen, so I, I would put Jaws. Uh, I'm not going to expand on Jaws because I think I was given the opportunity to do that earlier in full. But what I stated earlier about why I love Jaws with his arc stands. And to the same degree, Hugo Drax. I did touch on Drax that I just thought Michael Lonsdale did an amazing job. I thought his delivery was perfect. He was he was weird. He was memorable. He was... He was bombastic. He was everything I want out of a main Bond villain. And I think he was given a very difficult screenplay. I think they tried to ram James Bond into space due to the success of Star Wars. And there's this clip I've seen of Cubby Broccoli where he says, we're not science fiction, we're science fact. And I just facepalm at that. And I go, my goodness, this is James Bond in space with lasers and a gonna poison the planet but then reseed it with genetically perfect people like oh, that's not science fact but drax michael lonsdale the, he just he killed it for what the role was okay let's get into some real nitty-gritty stuff now so the bond actors we've had six how would you rank them one to six this is where we get all the comments from our listeners to say you're wrong you're wrong or you may get total agreement but the floor is yours well you know Thank you, and I appreciate that. And even though this may be the most important list, 
Um, I believe I've expanded on most of the bonds that I don't really need to expand on it unless you would like me to expand on any of my picks. But number one, Pierce Brosnan. Number two, Timothy Dalton. Number three, Roger Moore. Number four, Sean Connery. Number five, Daniel Craig. And number six, George Lazenby. I will follow up on one pick, if you don't mind. And not necessarily that I disagree, but George Lazenby. Do you think he is hindered by the fact that he only got one try at it? Do you think that ranking may have changed had he been given a few more bites at the cherry? Partially, though I would probably only ascribe one third of the blame to that. Now, I'm not sure if you know, but his voice was dubbed over for his one film as well to get rid of that harsh Australian accent or so they thought. So you have a Bond actor that is not only dubbed over, but he's only in one film. And I do think you have to suspend judgment. I would never say he's a bad Bond. If you were to say, oh, well, if you were to have come at me with the question, say, well, is George Lazenby the worst Bond? Is he a bad Bond? I would say, no, he's at the bottom of my list, but it's almost like it did not have enough information. And especially that he was dubbed over it's very difficult for me to judge his performance other than anything physical he did. So I mentioned the final scene of Honor Majesty's Secret Service where his wife dies and he's holding her in his arms. And that was the most emotional, vulnerable moment that Bond had shown to that point. It's still one of the most vulnerable moments in the entire series. And Lazenby had to do that with or I judged his good performance with his face and his body language, because that's all I have to go off of with him. So maybe I've got a question. You mentioned earlier about Timothy Dalton only having two films and you obviously ranked him higher. Would you have liked to have seen him have more films? And if so, would have you liked to have seen Roger Moore have fewer films to fit in more Dalton films because obviously if you do it afterwards it would impact Brosnan having fewer films or how how would you do it or would you just say no leave it at two or would you say actually Roger Moore finished one or two films films earlier because he's a bit too old and Dalton come in a bit earlier what, what's your thoughts on that I what you proposed I'm in 100% agreement if you want to know the nitty-gritty I would have knocked Roger Moore out of both Octopussy and A View to a Kill. I would have had Timothy Dalton as the 80s Bond through the entire 80s. Uh, and I would have given Brosnan, given the fact that there was that, I think, six-year gap, I would have given Brosnan Goldeneye. I mean, I'm never going to argue against how Goldeneye turned out. But yes, you're correct. I, I've told this to my friends and family as well. I thought the magic number for Timothy Dalton was four films. Sometimes, you know, you can think, well, it, it was, you know, great that uh, Connery, I think he got six or seven films. Uh, Craig got five. That felt about right, even though he was trying to get out of the role. But I always felt that for Dalton, four. Four would have really cemented his legacy. And I'm not sure how much you guys look up James Bond in comment sections, again, on YouTube or whatnot. But there has been a very large recent surge in Timothy Dalton fans online. I can tell you that. He is way up there, even with his two films. I see a lot of that on Reddit, on the James Bond forum, about Timothy Dalton. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm in complete agreement with that. So, but, but good point. Yeah. Four films. I wish he was the Bond of the 80s. You know, the one I thought you guys would question me on is Sean Connery being on the lower end. Uh, my dad, he's a huge Sean Connery fan. And I know a lot of people that have seen the odd bond and it's almost like it's the cool pick to say, Oh, I love that Sean Connery back in the day. Uh, but no, I, I can definitively say it could just be personal taste. Uh, I just, no, Con Connery is, he's not at the bottom as you see, but he's nowhere near the top. Yeah. I kind of interpreted that based on your your other answers where you've not really picked any connery films or 
Bond girls, villains, you know, from earlier on in your in your interview. One thing I did, the question that I just remembered was obviously Martin Campbell directed GoldenEye, and which is obviously your favorite film, and also Casino Royale, which is obviously one of your um, least favorite films. Um, I find that a bit surprising because obviously Martin Campbell, a lot of people um, really like his two entries in the Bond franchise, and it's quite one extreme to the other with like golden eye casino well in terms of what your opinions are aren't they in terms of both those films yeah and and i did know that he was the director of both of them and to be honest i don't have a straight answer for you because all these years i have wondered why i don't like casino royale that much i mean i can tell you like i did that i felt the first 40 percent of the movie was very sloppy doll up hearts hard to follow unlike golden eye i guess you know i think partially it could be what he was given to work with as much as i like the the drama of the poker game it is just a poker game le chiffre le chiffre however you say it mads mickelson i'm sorry he's not gonna hold a candle to a double o agent He's not going to hold a candle to Sean Bean, and that may just be my personal taste, but, I mean, he was okay. But uh, part of it could just be what what the director was given to work with. And the fact that when with Goldeneye, he was directing just a traditional Bond. Yeah, Bond had been out of the cycle for six years, but it was just Bond. And, yeah, we had a new M, so he had to deal with a new M and a new Bond. But he didn't have to deal with this reboot this complete reboot so i'm just spitballing when i suggest that last question in terms of the rankings is what are your favorite top five bond theme songs obviously you mentioned earlier on uh, a view to a kill so what are your two to five rankings yeah and for this i went with um specifically true themes five themes so yeah i did mention um a view to a kill would be my my of the main themes the true themes that's my number one uh nobody does it better by carly simon i love that as a number number two i just i find it a beautiful song i can't really elaborate on it more than that i just like the song uh skyfall by adele i thought was really good because it had some james bond themes like some J john barry themes throughout it hidden in it and i just thought it was a very good haunting well sung uh song another one that i listen to when i work uh live and let die i just thought it was a banger of a rock song i mean paul mccartney outside of his time with the beatles what do you always hear of him played on the radio paul mccartney and the wings were in general i think kind of forgettable but man with live and let die great song great song um, and then on Her Majesty's Secret Service, it's the song has no lyrics, so it's unique in that way. But I mean, man, for not having lyrics, that banger of a bass line, that dun 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 Oh, I just love that. And then, you know, it's just the brass comes in. Da 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 I just thought it was really good for the scope of that bond particularly when that theme was used when the camera was zoomed out say during like the ski chase i i just think it had this grandiose nature to it that was really good for that film so that's my number five have you heard the propeller heads on a majesty's secret service song from the was it late 90s early noughties i have i love it it is actually i believe it is the only third party remix that is on my um james bond uh playlist uh where i basically assembled a bunch of songs off youtube my favorite themes and i'll listen to that often um and that is the only song that is not one of the official release themes that is is on that playlist that and the 12 minute extended cut of a view to a kill yeah jay and i um went to went to see a bond band i guess you'd call them uh called cue the music based out of, out of the uk i think they're actually f finished up earlier this year but they've been touring together for many many years and they basically played all the bond theme songs a 
bar die another day um but then there's like a, a few bonus songs that they put in one was the propeller heads version that was actually the first time i'd heard that and it just blew me away that was just absolutely sensational that was it, it it's fantastic you can tell the propeller heads really understood what was fantastic about that song um and i feel they accentuated what was good about it instead of just being like we're the propeller heads and we're taking over this whole song and we're going to bury the theme behind whatever we want to do i felt like they really took the best parts of that song and just amplified it and the concert me andy just mentioned that we went to uh, a few months ago I, I can't think of the technical term andy so feel free to correct me it was actually presented by caroline bliss who played miss money penny in the living daylights yeah she was like uh compare i guess that's say. it yeah. yeah yeah so she had she had a wow. few little uh anecdotes of her time on the on the bond films or well, she did obviously the two with with dalton uh particularly like the story she gave of uh, uh was it her first day on set yeah where yeah. um she was dressed as what she thought um money penny should dress like and she went over to dalton and the director and like opened a coat she got a coat or a robe over the top and she opened her top say what do you think of this uh, not realizing that her whole outfit had come undone and she was actually flashing her breast um, <laughs> which was, uh, was quite quite the first impression but that was uh, that was a cool story as she as she gave it that night <laughs> i wonder if delton had a one-liner for that you never know <laughs> lost to time so moby just just before um andy moves on with the next question just so you know um andy has created a special the waiting room playlist on spotify of all the bond f um, songs as well and from memory i think you, you included the propeller heads or at least one of the versions and you also included andy which film was it um like a secondary song um as well that there they was, played at the concert yeah it was one of the dalton ones again it was the song that was playing in the bar when they were having a fight scene it was the song dirty love oh, um, which okay. is on on the soundtrack to i think it's licensed to kill interesting it's the, it's the scene where he's got the big swordfish uh it takes the swordfish off the wall and uses it as a weapon which i thought was was hilarious uh but yeah so so we kind of originally just had the 25 themes but then obviously there's there's these nuggets of other songs either on the soundtrack or in the background that just kind of added to the end but that's another another good one that they played that night as well let's get one final question in before uh, we wrap things up um what would you say are some of the more underrated bond films out there uh I would say two. Now, it's interesting because uh, I think The Living Daylights is one. I won't really highlight on that too much because I just think it's somehow forgotten. I don't have a reason why. Um, but I, as as Jay mentioned, I haven't brought up Sean Connery a lot at all in any of my picks. But Diamonds Are Forever is what I believe is the most underrated Bond film. I... I just love it. I just thought it was creative. I, you've got, I mean, some of it is over the top, but hey, that's James Bond. You've got Blofeld having all these clones that Bond has to knock off. I thought Wint and Kid, the two henchmen, were just fantastic. Two of the best henchmen in the entire uh, uh, series. Had I been allowed to pick six hench people or villains, Earlier on, I would have put Wint and Kid next together. They are just great. And one of them, I think it's Wint, is played by Bruce Glover, Crispin Glover's dad. And Crispin Glover, I uh, played Marty McFly's dad in, uh, in Back to the Future. Very eccentric actor. But you can see where he gets his acting eccentricities from. Bruce Glover is very similar in his creepy delivery that he does through that whole... Uh, movie it's delicious i thought jill st john was a great uh bond girl um she kind of weirdly goes from like very competent to kind of like a bimbo and then back again to bond's arms but um it's yeah it's interesting uh so yeah that those those would be the two that were underrated great stuff well i think that about wraps things up for this week uh, moby thank you ever so much for your time it's been a real pleasure talking to you about all things james bond and for listeners out there feel free to check out the t hood podcast uh with with moby um i'm sure is on all the usual 
channels, Spotify, YouTube, and and the like. And yep. listen out for more specials in the future where we we speak into more Bond fans, Bond super fans. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon on the rating room. Thank you guys. Really appreciate it. it was awesome. Well, that's this week's episode done. We hope you enjoyed it. Special thanks to the band Sugar Tongue for the theme tune to The Rating Room. You can find them on all the usual social media channels. And be sure to check out their song The System, available now on Spotify. You can find and message us on Twitter, Facebook, TikTok and Instagram by searching The Rating Room. You'll find all our social media links on our website, theratingroom.com and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Or feel free to drop us an email at theratingroom at gmail.com. Goodbye, thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week, right here on The Rating Room. Mm-hmm.